intersecting probably 10 different trends. I talked about all the business models. You know, I talked about the growth of marketplaces, all these new tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people that are, you know, looking at ecosystems is what they do. This idea, we can't go at it alone. And to disconnect channels, you know, being synonymous with the way money changes hands and start looking at channel partnerships or channel ecosystems as getting the customer to the dance, getting them on the dance floor, which in a subscription is the first 30 days, and then keeping them dancing all night long. Those are all partnership conversations embedded in each of those parts of my company. The technology alliances, the strategic alliances, the business alliances. And again, I don't care if you sell pharmaceuticals, if you sell cars, if you're a manufacturer, if you're trying to sell software, I don't care what industry you're in. Nobody in this decade of the ecosystem can do it alone. Today, I'm delighted to have in our show our repeated guest, Jay McBain from Forrester. Jay is leading Forrester Research in ecosystem partnerships, alliances, and channel. And he is one of the most prominent, but also insightful uh, voices in, in, in this respect globally. He's consulting a lot of CEOs of, of large companies uh, and um, he's leading the entire community of people who work in partnerships and ecosystem. We discussed how trends in partnership and ecosystem accelerate uh, in 2022 compared to 2021 when we caught up last time. And what are the things that would need your attention, why ecosystem roles should be cross-functional, why partnerships becoming a must rather than just nice to have, and how do you accelerate partner-led growth? If you enjoy this content, please keep subscribe below, comment, and without further ado, Jay McBain. It's this great time of the year when we come together, and uh, I was actually looking forward to that, to discuss with you trends of decade of ecosystem, right? So you, you mentioned some time ago that last decade was decade of marketing, before that decade of sale, now it's decade of ecosystem or partnerships, I would say, uh, and we are in early innings, second year, we discussed last year a couple of trends, and I would love to ask you, what are you most excited about starting 2022? In the decade of the ecosystem, especially early in the decade, we're watching uh, the people with great interest. Uh, we're watching the processes and the automation to get ready for it. We're watching the programs as they evolve. And obviously we're watching the technology that sits underneath it that went from 17 companies to 34 companies, and there's like 60 or 70 companies now. So I'll start with people. Uh, in the last week, uh, companies like Google Cloud uh, replaced their channel chief now with an ecosystem chief. Much bigger role than just the channel transactional and, and, and some of the other partner types. They're looking at really by partner role at, at this time. You know, a company like Rackspace, changed out a couple of their channel chiefs and put in an ecosystem chief. IBM just hired an ecosystem chief, you know, kind of from the outside. You've got, um, you know, Microsoft who did that midway through last year. So almost every day now we're seeing an announcement on the people side. And then if you just scan LinkedIn, there's almost 9,000 people now that have ecosystem in their title. They're the chief ecosystem officer. They're the vice president of partner ecosystems. And, and that's really interesting. And that's been on a big climb upwards. Uh, and if you just search the word ecosystems inside what people do on LinkedIn, it shows up almost a half a million times in terms of people have some level of responsibility for not only building, again, the channel more transactional partnerships, but building out the technology alliances, the business alliances, the strategic alliances, the influence partners, the retention style partners, and 80% of all of that isn't you know, transacting or partner sourced. It's now moved into this partner assisted conversation. Interesting that you mentioned Microsoft uh, and Google, uh, which are like overachievers, I would say, right? In, in, the last, uh, in the last report. But what I love about you, is that you actually think from first principles, right? You think from customer lens, uh, kind of staying, trying to stay away from, from over taxing on marketing terms. And uh, I think we, the last time we, we, we spoke with you, we were talking about that no one owns customer anymore, right? Like how do you influence customers? How do you build uh, like your partnership in a way that it influences customers through the entire journey and so on? What are the trends that you are seeing kind of accelerating in 2022? 
One of the trends is organizationally. So I, I talked about people, you know, changing roles and, and taking on a bigger remit in, in terms of how they look at partnerships. Uh, but the, under, the other understanding for 40 years, the channel organization in most companies that, that we look at is its own silo. There's a head of channel, there's a head of channel marketing, channel sales, channel operations, channel finance. It kind of sits out on their own. The you know, channel marketing people don't really talk to the direct marketing people. The channel sales people don't talk enough to the direct sales people. So it's really its own thing. And in ecosystems, we're starting to see, and I relate this almost to data science. You know, companies that created data science, you know, type of things and created a leader of data science. The idea wasn't to create a whole group of data scientists that can be deployed in different places. They literally deployed them in different places. So data scientists entered marketing, they entered sales, they entered customer success, operations, finance, HR. There was a group of matrixed data scientists that dotted line back to some science leader or chief technology officer or something like that, or chief digital officer. But the fact is, is you put the people in the place and embed them where their role is. And so ecosystems are going the same route. You know, we need to influence customers, both in the direct marketing we do and through partnerships. It makes sense that the ecosystem marketing folks that are focused on influence sit in marketing. The salespeople, that sales assist type of partners, whether a customer buys through a marketplace indirectly or directly, it really doesn't matter to most companies in a subscription model because that's the first 30 days with the customer. Now, embedding ecosystem people in with customer success groups, making sure partners are there driving adoption, integration, stickiness, upsell, cross-sell, enrichment, and keeping that customer for life is an embedded function inside customer success. And so this ecosystem chief doesn't have thousands of direct reports. They have a highly matrixed organization that are going after a single program, a single global set of goals and KPIs, but they understand that this needs to be an embedded model inside the product and the product teams, inside the business, the strategy teams, and obviously along that customer journey. So that's one of the interesting things. And we're just seeing this in the last couple of months. Completely agree with you, actually. Um, I had a conversation with a couple of users of our product uh, who, uh, who were talking about that. It, it seems that the, the, the overall trend is this is happening because it's much more cost effective to acquire customer and retain customer through this partnerships or ecosystem. Uh, motions, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's actually more difficult in the, in, in the short term, right? It's more difficult to build it uh, and prove it and scale it. And I guess a lot of people who, whose role is like head of partnerships or head of ecosystem actually struggle uh, to elevate their prominence within organization, like to actually prove that they, 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 their role is one of the most valuable. And um, so two questions about that. Number one, who this head of ecosystem should report to or head of partnerships should report to? And number two, how, to, how would you elevate uh, your, 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 your voice within the company? So on the first one, Accenture did that piece of research uh, a couple of years ago that said 76% of CEOs think their current business model will be unrecognizable in five years. And ecosystems were the number one reason why. So that tells me that the ecosystem chief for those 76% of CEOs report to the CEO. It's also cross-functional, as I mentioned. It touches every vice president that reports or every C-level person that reports to the CEO. Um, so it makes sense that that person you know, sits in the boardroom as well. As each of these CEOs, and they think of their business model, whether it's a subscription consumption, whether it's usage-based or value-based, whether it's product-led growth, which is on a tear in, in the SaaS worlds, uh, whether it's going through marketplaces and all these changes are happening at once, given the new buyer. Um, so I'd want to make sure that I have my partnership strategy at the table. Uh, again, everything I just mentioned in terms of business model is not your traditional indirect sales two-tier model. So the, the channel was always synonymous with revenue, profit, customer sat. New subscription businesses look more like Netflix in the way they're rated by um, investors. So it's subscribers, new subscribers this quarter, new logos, and then churn rate. 
that replaces revenue, profit, and customer set. So those three things, I got to make sure that I have a partnership strategy. My ecosystem has the capabilities to go get new logos, has the ability to drive customers for life. And I want to make sure that driving this new model and the success of this new model, 90% of it's going to be partner assisted. So if that's the case, I want that person at the boardroom table to make all that work. In one of, the, one of your talks, you mentioned Microsoft, which is 96%, right? Um, partner assisted. And Salesforce as well. I love your concept. Uh, we, we were talking in our uh, podcast previously about minimal viable partnerships, but you taking it to the next level and you have a concept about minimal viable partner program, right? Uh, could you could you just briefly share what is that, why it's important, what are the organizations that uh, need to set it up uh, and yeah, how, how it should look like? So the MVCP, Minimum Viable Channel Program, you think of you know where we were a year or two years ago when we spoke. Um, now we have 76% of CEOs. That means 76% of the 175,000 software companies today. That means 76% of the emerging tech companies today. IoT, AI, automation, blockchain, the new metaverse, whichever emerging tech you want to talk about. Um, 76% of every you know, legacy company across 27 industries. So this is a big deal. And, and many companies of relatively large size are creating their first program. And you know, the idea is that you could go into a hundred different parts of the program from that recruitment to onboarding, education, training, certifications and competencies, incentives, motivation and loyalty, co-selling, co-marketing, all the enablement around technology and marketing and stuff. So there's a hundred elements to a fully fledged program, but coming out of the gate, you're not going to go build a Microsoft class, Oracle class, SAP class, you know, program, HP or Dell class program, Lenovo that's been around for decades. You're going to have to go and touch on the most important things. When I said, you know, the onboarding is critical. You don't have to go build a whole library and, and curriculum and university, but you have to hit a minimum viable lev level to get your partners activated. You, you know, when I talk about incentives, it doesn't mean that we have to tease out, you know, incentive programs to the seventh decimal point in all 197 countries. And, but we do have to be very thoughtful about the competitive uh, landscape and, and where we need to be to get a seat at the table. It's the table stakes. You know, that co-marketing and co-sales, you know, we probably are not going to enable a full through channel marketing automation platform with all joint campaigns and market development funds and everything else. But at a high level, we do have to help our partners at a local level, distributed or localized marketing to go and win on Google, to go and win on social, to go and win in email marketing, to go win on some physical marketing, maybe billboards or you know, radio ads. So there's all kinds of considerations there, but at a minimum level, we have to make sure we check the boxes on sales and marketing enablement or we're not gonna be successful. And that's really the minimum viable. So in a hundred different things you should be doing in your program long-term, there's maybe 25 or 30 of them that are the minimum viable things that you need to do to be successful in partnerships. That makes a lot of sense. And um, I really like this term. Now that we discussed one edge of the range and then let, let, let's go to another, you, you made a prediction that, uh, you know, Salesforce will become a, a trillion dollar company. And uh, also like Microsoft uh, right now is talking a lot about multiplier and also other big companies are talking about multiplier, about how do you influence or like partner or influence revenue across uh, the, the ecosystem. C can you speak a little bit more about this uh, best in class examples coming from this big tech uh, in terms of influencer, influencer revenue through, through partnerships, building platforms, and why do you think Salesforce will be another trillion dollar company? Larger SaaS companies, and the, obviously the hyperscalers and others, the, the fastest growing companies today out there um, in, in the industry, are changing the way they build content and messaging out to the channel. You know, a company like Salesforce or a company like HubSpot have effectively shut down their resale program. It's not a place where they see value and they want the money to flow through their own marketplaces. And so 
you know, they're not really actively looking for resellers and they're not really, you know, turning on that switch to current partners unless the customer absolutely requires it. So in that world, they've turned differently. And, and Salesforce was actually the first company to ever do this. They published their TCO. They published the dollar amount. Back then it was like $4 and something for every dollar of Salesforce to get it to work. Today, in the, in the most recent report, it's up to like $6.19 for every dollar of Salesforce to get it to work. So that means it needs to be installed, implemented, integrated, secured, compliant, continuity. There has to be data and automation. Think of all the long-term services wrapped around it. But as a customer, by the way, 64% of that $6 is services. There are six other ISVs on average that are sold on the App Exchange. And then now there's some hardware coming in as well. Hybrid cloud, Internet of Things, other types of things. So, you know, keep in mind that that whole solution, which is the dollar for Salesforce, the $6.19, the customer could spend $7.19 to get it to work all in one place. But that, you know, for years, for decades inside this industry, we hid that number. In client server, the TCO was so bad, it created the managed services industry, you know, to go help reduce those costs for customers and make them more predictable and linear. But in the case of cloud, it was pretty shocking to say that, hey, if you're going to spend $100,000 with us, we hope you have a half a million dollars in the bank to get it to work. And now every company is fast following, where HubSpot is $5.80. A lot of that's digital services, creative services, digital agency type of services. A uh, company like Google Cloud we just did at $5.70. Microsoft is out in the market talking about unlocking trillions of dollars of ecosystem value. It takes the heat off your program. If a customer wants to buy through a marketplace, if they want to buy direct, if they want to buy indirect, it doesn't matter. The point is, it's not the 20% of the deal that a partner can go win and maybe three or five points on the back end. It's the 200 or 300% of the deal that they can go win at 75% margin. And that's where the partners that are growing the fastest are building skills, building practices and using the program inside these companies to go build out those muscles to say, hey, for that $100,000 deal, I'm going to charge you $200,000, but I'm going to do this list of things to make it work. And that's where this industry is going. There's always going to be a resale element. Today, it's trillions of dollars. And you know we expect that not to drop, but you know, stay pretty steady. But you know those partners... We're, we're really looking at the ones that are um, eating up that messaging and looking at that program to build out that long-term success around these really fast-growing companies. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, so this is like a big tech. What about mid-size? Mid I mean, <laughs> you, you love the term mid-size clinic. Uh, it's like talking about mid-size growth stage companies uh, as they sort of aspire to be become this like you're saying, like sounds around which everyone revolves or like they do something differently compared to this big tech? I grew up, uh, you know, running SMB for companies like IBM, uh, for companies like Lenovo, um, as well as small companies that I worked at as small businesses, including founding my own. Um, so I really spend a lot of my time, you know, at that average size partner. You know, there's 75,000 managed service providers. There's 500,000 VARs. The average size is about eight people. I'm really interested in that size of business because that's where most of this industry goes through SMB and through, you know, mid-market. So in that world, you know, these are not people that are with eight people setting up new business practices and, you know, gearing up for a side business or whatever else. So I'm really interested in the business model there and, and how a vendor, you know, works with these partners at scale you know, to make them successful. In a lot of cases, it's just introducing one opportunity. You know, a, a company with eight people is probably not going to go charge you, you know, 200,000 for every 100,000 you're spending on a product. But if they could do the security, you know, managed service providers, 73% of them want to become managed security solution providers. So if I could provide the compliance and the security and the governance, maybe I could ask for 50 cents on every dollar that you're buying, let's say in a hyperscaler world. And I can be the one that comes in on the seven layers of security at the endpoint, through the network, the internet, the file, the data, the applications, 
looking at this multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, zero trust model. You know, I can aspire to that and it's not too far out of my wheelhouse to be able to do. I'm not asking that eight person company to become Accenture or Deloitte, but there's definitely other values they can add to that customer that are more sticky, more profitable. And again, don't rely on the actual transaction, which even Microsoft this week with the introduction of NCE is causing some um, tension in the marketplace with changing around how the buying of the product works. And so, you know, partners have to move on from that as a singular focus. Which is a nice transition to my previous to last question. Last year, we talked about partner experience, its importance, and we discussed that companies too distracted with uh, needing to just go back to the business. Uh, I just uh, want your update. Where do you think partner experience, uh, all importance, importance of partner experience, what's the current state? Yeah, there's a nexus of partner experience. There's a bunch of things that uh, intersect to drive partner experience. And you know some of the biggest growth areas, obviously, are around the technology space, making it fully automated, self-service. The average of the 35,000 vendors that we work with that you know run channel programs in, in one way or another are channel friendly. Um, you know the idea is that um, their channel that they built is about one tenth the size of the ecosystem they need. So, you know, for every small company that says has a hundred partners, they probably need a thousand. If they have a thousand, they might probably need 10,000. That's, we talk to big companies that have a hundred thousand partners and we walk through the million partners that they're probably going to need later in the decade. So if there's a 10 X multiplier, you're not going to get 10 X more people. You're not going to darken the skies with planes and, and do the coverage model with channel account managers and things you've done in the past. You've got to look at yourself like a banking app. And when's the last time you saw a teller? Because you can deposit checks, you can do almost everything you did in front of a teller now in an app. The, the partner portal and all of the elements of the partner program now become like that banking app. I shouldn't wait for humans. I shouldn't have any humans as gates into what I need to get done as a partner. Whether I need to be enabled, whether I need to be onboarded, whether I need to be in set, all those elements, the minimum viable right up to the full-fledged program ought to be done automatically. And I should be able to 24 seven go in and self-service and not wait for people. When I do interact with people, it's around deals. It's around opportunities. It's around co-innovation, network effects. It's around things like uh, value creation. Those are the highly creative, specialized roles that humans do so well. Chasing data and connecting dots and making program approvals and things ought to be fully automated. And that's partner experience. So as a partner, I can run my business, I can partner effectively with, with a vendor, and all of that can be done, and, and I never have to visit a teller. Now, when I talk, want to talk about growing my business, where that multiplier is, what skills, what business practices, where I should be digging in, what's different in my market, what are the things we could do around marketing and selling together, what are the things we... That's the conversation I want to have with a human, and I don't want that human being caught up with a bunch of that you know, chasing data and doing QBRs and, and, and things like that of the past. I completely agree with you. And this is pretty much what we're doing in Partner Insight. Uh, if you have ex one extra minute, very last question. So you, I know that you are uh, speaking to CEOs of, of many companies and you're meeting them in the boardrooms, I mean, those Zoom kind of settings. Uh, what is the top of mind things that you are typically telling them these days? So we're uh, intersecting probably 10 different trends. I talked about all the business models. You know, I talked about the growth of marketplaces, all these new tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people that are, you know, looking at ecosystems is what they do. This idea, we can't go at it alone. And to disconnect channels, you know, being synonymous with the way money changes hands and start looking at channel partnerships or channel ecosystems as getting the customer to the dance, getting them on the dance floor, which in a subscription is the first 30 days and then keeping them dancing all night long. Those are all partnership conversations embedded in each of those parts of my company. The technology alliances, the strategic alliances, the business alliances. And again, I don't care if you sell pharmaceuticals, if you sell cars, if you're a manufacturer, if you're trying to sell software, I don't care what industry you're in. Nobody in this decade of the ecosystem can do it alone.
Jay, uh, it's been a brilliant conversation as always. And thank you so much uh, for you can keep in this industry. And I remember speaking with you some time ago, we discussed different trends and now this trends actually came to life and it's, 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 it's pretty phenomenal. And uh, I look forward to following you and, uh, and advise everyone who listening to this to follow you as well. Uh, uh, and uh, until the next time. Thank you so much.